everybody. And welcome to the director seminar today. Uh, as you can see, I'm not the director. My name is Joe Lighting. Uh, Art Kramer is out of town today. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's director seminar speaker, Professor Mark Rubley. And let me just say a little bit about his background. Martin was born in Stuttgart in 1964. He's lived in Austria and Spain before he came to the States, where he went to Berkeley. He got his BS in 1984 and a PhD in 1988. Uh, he worked in high-resolution spectroscopy of molecular ions and clusters in the group of Richard Sekulay. In 1989, he went on to do pentochemistry in the lab of Ahmed Zewell at Caltech. And many of you know that uh, Professor Zewell won the Nobel Prize for that work. And then he moved, uh, Mark moved to Illinois in 1992 after completing his, his postdoc. He's currently the James R. Eisner Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Physics, Biophysics, and Computational Biology at Illinois. He's a fellow of the American Physical and Biophysical Societies, and he received the Koblenz and Wilhelm Bessel Awards, among many other awards. In 2008, he was elected a member of the German National Academy of Sciences, and in 2010, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. From 1998 to 2005, he served as senior editor of the Journal of Physical Chemistry and continues to serve on many editorial advisory boards. His research focuses on protein and RNA folding, imaging dynamics in live cells, laser spectroscopy of vibrational energy flow in molecules, the theory of quantum computing and quantum control, as well as single molecule absorption spectroscopy detected by scanning following microscopy. His work is published in over 150 papers and reviews. On the educational and mentoring side, uh, Martin has participated in summer schools from China to the Netherlands, taught chemistry at Hanoi University of Science, is currently adjunct professor of physics at MSU, provide backward mentoring in biological physics. Today, Mark will be presenting the talk, Proteins, Nanotubes, and Glasses, Science Adventures at the Beckman Institute. So please join me in welcoming Mark Grubley. Hey, let's see, am I loud enough that people in the back can hear me? Otherwise, I'll put on the other microphone also. It's OK in the back? All right. Well, it's a great pleasure to give a uh, Beckman Director Seminar to the home crowd. And the, uh, the free food works on me just as well as on everybody else in the room and get people to come. <coughs> I'm going to talk about, well, exactly what it says there. Some of the work that we've done over the last uh, you know, 18 years or so that I've been at, uh, affiliated with the Beckman Institute in one way or another, proteins, nanotubes, and glasses. And uh, there's a somewhat older group picture and a somewhat newer one that highlights some of the, uh, you know, past and current people's working on some of the projects I'm going to talk about. Peng Lu on the protein side of things, uh, Josh Ballard and Aaron Carmichael on the scanning tunneling microscopy where we collaborate with Joe Lighting's group. Same thing goes for Greg Scott and Sumit Ashtekar in that viewer picture. And then one of our newest, youngest students here to arrive at the Beckman Institute, Leah Nienhaus. And uh, none of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here would have been possible without our Beckman collaborators. Uh, Joe Lighting, uh, Klaus Schulten on the computational you know, uh, theory side, uh, Steve Bopart, and uh, Jeff Moore. And I'm going to focus basically just on projects that, that projects that we've gotten done with them you know, pretty much over here at the uh, Beckman Institute. So uh, we're a spectroscopy and theory group, and we do work in protein and RNA folding, as uh, 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 Joe was alluding to. We also do uh, various types of gas phase spectroscopy, looking at energy flow in molecules and how one might be able to control energy flow. And of course, when you're talking about molecules, you have to invoke quantum mechanics. Uh, we look at protein dynamics in live cells these days, although that work is going over somewhere at the other end of the camp, so I'm not going to talk about that here. And something that really couldn't have happened without uh, you know, Joe Lighting's group, who are the experts in UHV scanning tunneling microscopy is the work on doing single molecule absorption spectroscopy and glassy surface dynamics. And in the first of these, basically, you're combining laser spectroscopy with scanning tunneling microscopy. You get spatial resolution and 
uh, wavelength resolution on the uh, systems that you're looking at. So I'm going to start with the protein topic as the first one. <coughs> and one of the things that we've concentrated on since the mid-90s is to look at fast-folding proteins. And uh, actually, it turns out all proteins fold pretty fast. Uh, even so-called slow-folding folding proteins that take maybe a few hours to fold, that's a time scale that's much faster than uh, normal bond breaking or making the time scales at room temperature. You know, if I take a flask of benzene, which would, of course, should spontaneously combust to make CO2 and water, you know, if it's exposed to air, it's not going to do that. It's going to sit there for years and years and not do anything because there's a very high free energy barrier. So even the slowest protein folding reaction is actually an extremely fast chemical reaction if it takes place in a time course of a few hours. But what I mean by fast folding here specifically is things that really fold fast, <coughs> something on the order of uh, sub-milliseconds, microseconds, maybe even getting into the hundreds of nanoseconds kind of time scales. Why study such things? Well, uh, one of the things that allows you to do is to actually look at what the physical limits on evolution are. You know, evolution uh, for function proteins and for their ability to fold is subject to physical constraints. The protein has a Hamiltonian. It can only move around in such and so many ways as it interacts with the solvent. And uh, you know, protein folding <coughs> is not going to occur, for instance, as fast as a uh, bond-breaking chemical reaction goes across the transition state, which is you know, femtoseconds, actually, or picoseconds. Uh, but it's going to be, you know, will have to be slower than that, even if it's very fast. Uh, another thing is that it turns out actually that uh, unfolding and refolding is a very common thing that proteins do in cells. I mean, proteins are of course manufactured on the ribosome and then they fold for the first time. Okay, but in order to function, proteins have to be relatively flexible, and the price you pay for that flexibility is that proteins have relatively small equilibrium constants for their stability. So a, a protein, a typical protein has an equilibrium constant of maybe 1,000 or 10,000, okay? which means that 1,000 to 1 10,000th of its time, this protein is going to spend in the unfolded state. Right? And a typical protein, I mean, it varies, of course. It's shorter for signaling proteins, longer for metabolic proteins. has a lifetime that goes from maybe days to week you know, in that order in a cell. And so that means you're spending on the order of minutes to hours actually unfolding during that time. Okay. And, that, and these events cannot all be assisted by chaperoning, simply because there's not enough chaperones in the cell. And of course, the chaperones undergo spontaneous unfolding events themselves. Okay. Um, so it is helpful you know, from the point of view of uh, uh, <coughs> keeping proteins not exposed <laughs> to being broken into pieces in cells when they unfold to have that process happen relatively quickly. But then there's also a very practical motivation, uh, and that's basically that we can compare directly with simulations. Simulations, you know, 10, <coughs> 15 years ago, doing 100 nanoseconds was sort of, you know, pushing it pretty hard. Nowadays, we can get into the <coughs> microseconds or even milliseconds. And at the same time, the experiments have come down in time scale from doing proteins that, you know, fold in minutes or hours to looking at proteins that fold in a few microseconds. And so that means we can actually overlap the two and do, uh, you know, comparisons, validate the theory with the experiments. And because experiments don't contain the same kind of atomic uh, information that you have, let's say, in a molecular dynamic simulation, we can then, once we're, we trust the simulation somewhat more because it fits together with the experimental data, we can actually then look at the uh, simulation and extract a lot more information from the atomistic details in that simulation. So for us anyway, you know, protein folding has been studied, of course, since the 1930s and 40s and really as a sort of physical chemistry subject since the 1960s when Anfinsen figured out that it is actually a somewhat reversible process. So I can take a protein, change its temperature or pH or some condition, and it'll unfold. And if I switch it back to the original condition, it'll actually refold with very good yield. Not perfectly, because you do form some aggregates and things like that, and, you know, and, and those will not revert to the native state. Uh, but proteins, by and large, are able to do this process of folding fairly reversibly. But for us, it all started with the small protein myoglobin at the Beckman Institute, which also happens to be actually the first protein for which an X-ray crystal structure, Kendrew and co-workers, uh, was done in the 1960s. And it turns out people have done NMR spectroscopy in this protein and shown that half of the protein folds on a time scale that was not resolvable by the NMR technology at the time. And so we did experiments uh, that were approximately uh, 1,000 times better, actually more like 100,000 times better time resolution. And it turns out that we found phases in the refolding kinetics, so you know, there's a scale of microseconds here, uh, and here you're looking at a fluorescent signal from a probe tryptophan amino acid in the protein. 
And we basically saw uh, that this half of the protein that uh, could not be resolved by those experiments actually folds in a matter of a few microseconds. And by having labels in the right places, we were able to infer some coarse structural information on what must be going on during these uh, refolding steps. So luckily, Klaus Schulte wasn't far away. I mean, he's one of the few people who's been around this place even longer than I have, although there's others in the room that I see that have you know, done their time at the BI. And as I said, kinetics measurements like the ones that I show, you need some mechanistic interpretation because out of the experiments, you get, relative, you get relatively low resolution information. You know, maybe a distance between a pair of residues if you're doing a FRET experiment or the salt <coughs> exposure of a part of the protein, you know, if you're doing uh, something like looking at tryptophan wavelength and looking at the uh, solvent effects. And so this has been a very long-standing collaboration with a, a lot of stuff uh, published uh, jointly between Klaus's and my group, in some cases with jointly advised students, in other cases you know, with a student from my group getting help over there or vice versa. Uh, and so I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of, of uh, the kind of work that we did. So in the early days, uh, when it really wasn't possible to do multi-microsecond or millisecond simulations, uh, one of the things that we looked at was nanosecond relaxation processes and looking at these both in the experiment and looking at them in simulations. And one of the questions at that time was, uh, the question is, is every bump that you see when you monitor protein fluorescence an intermediate? So let me put a picture uh, with that statement. Uh, when a protein falls, it might go from its denatured state uh, to the native state over an energy barrier. And it might do this in a more or less direct fashion, like shown by that solid arrow there. Or it might be doing it a little bit more indirectly by getting trapped temporarily in other minima in the uh, free energy surface. And so sometimes when uh, you look at, uh, say, fluorescence as a function of time or by scanning the temperature or changing some variable, you might find there's a certain level of fluorescence in the native state and there's a certain level here in the denatured state, if I'm increasing temperature, for example. But then in between, the fluorescence goes outside the range of those two. And one easy thing to say would be therefore, well, there must be some kind of intermediate state that fluoresces even more than either of those that I'm going through in between. And therefore, the fluorescence temporarily goes higher you know, than these end points. Okay? And uh, the problem with that, uh, it turns out, though, is that in a lot of cases in the literature back then when we started looking into this problem, um, when you used other measurement techniques to look at the same protein, it just <coughs> gave you a simple two-step behavior. For instance, circular dichroism, which monitors secondary structure, it would just go from the native value to this value, and there wasn't really go anything going on in between. And this was true for other things, too, like infrared spectroscopy. So only the fluorescence <coughs> was doing it, and, and people were saying, well, well no matter. You know, the intermediate can only be seen by fluorescence, and the other techniques just don't show it. But you know, at some point, you do begin to wonder, you know, if it's an intermediate and it has an, you know, you know, why don't we see like at least a little step or something in there in the middle, you know, where, where this thing happens. And so we went to work on this with Klaus and did some experiments. Uh, and uh, we had a joint student at the time who was actually doing both the experiments and uh, the simulation work. And what we did in the experiments is basically, uh, so our hypothesis was a little different. Our hypothesis was that what's, what's actually happening is that when you're making the transition from the folded to the denatured state, the folded state, uh, becomes highly flexible during the unfolding transition. And that this flexibility allows the tryptophan side chain that's being used to monitor the fluorescence to wiggle around, sampling different you know, amounts of quenching from the you know, surrounding amino acids in the water and the protein, and that this actually causes hyperfluorescence. Uh, so that this fluorescence here is just part of the transition from the native to the denatured state, and you don't have to invoke some uh, special state. You simply have more mobility as you increase the temperature. And to test this idea that simply increasing the mobility of tryptophan side chains could actually in increase the fluorescence, we basically put holes in the protein by making mutants where we truncated away amino acids near the tryptophan. So it would be like more empty space, so to speak, there are solvent filled space that it can move around in. And we did measurements on that. And we found, sure enough, uh, that when we made holes far away from the tryptophan, like the one that's shown over there, there was no change in the tryptophan fluorescence intensity, or at least just a fairly small one. But as the hole got closer and closer to the tryptophan, you got an enormous ch increase in the uh, tryptophan fluorescence intensity, simply by increasing the mobility, not by making the protein unfolded. So this protein still has the same X-ray, uh, small angle X-ray <coughs> scattering, compactness, and everything that the folded state has. We could, of course, make even these proteins unfold by going to very high temperature. But just by putting that hole in, that was not enough to make the protein unfolded. So it was a native state, and it was showing highly increased fluorescence. And indeed, when you ran molecular dynamics simulations, 
uh, you did find, maybe not too surprisingly, that uh, <coughs> if you look basically at the wiggling around of the side chain, uh, that when you put the holes right next to the tryptophan residue, that you would get more wiggling. So you would get a uh, larger, uh, a, a bigger loss of anisotropy in these kinds of uh, calculations <laughs> that matched up actually perfectly with the, what we saw in the experiments. And so finally we come, came up with this model where you're taking uh, the protein and it has a bunch of conformational substates and you're exciting the tryptophan residue to probe the folding. And uh, as the uh, protein in the excited state fluctuates more among these conformational substates, uh, you actually find that you get a strong increase uh, in the fluorescence intensity. So in a lot of these cases, uh, we made the argument, and I still would make that same argument uh, now, is that you know, if you see some kind of a bump like this, just because there's a monotonic dependence, if you see that only by one measurement method, but never by anything else, don't necessarily believe that there really are additional states involved. So in the case of this protein here, it looked like the folding behavior was much simpler than involving a bunch of states. It simply went from the native state to the uh, denatured state. So let me fast forward over a whole bundle of papers that Klaus and I did together on various sorts of things. So another example, uh, <coughs> where we're looking at protein refolding from scratch. This was a paper that was done by his student, uh, 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 Fredolino, and my student, Lou, uh, a few years back. And it, sh it shows that the, now we've, we're getting to the point where actually simulations have the ability to pinpoint errors in force fields and then uh, correct the force fields. So what you're seeing on the uh, display there is a structure of the WW domain. It's a triple-stranded uh, 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 beta sheet protein that acts as a signaling protein in, for example, among other processes, cell apoptosis or cell death. And the trace that you're seeing below it in blue, uh, <coughs> that's the fit and the, and the data points, is the uh, folding relaxation. So the experiment we did here is to take this molecule, have it uh, folded, apply a small temperature jump to it that's done on a, a matter of a few nanoseconds. This changes the equilibrium constant between the folded and unfolded state by changing their free energies. And then you watch the relaxation to the new equilibrium. And uh, what you see in the relaxation is actually both the forwards and backwards reaction. And by doing this at different temperatures, you can actually extract the forward and backwards rates uh, separately. But the important thing here is that we have a relaxation time that's somewhere in the order of maybe 10 microseconds or thereabouts. And <coughs> what we did is we actually genetically engineered this protein quite a bit to get its folding time down from maybe 100 microseconds to about 10 microseconds. So it would get within the realm where it's easier to do simulations on it. OK, so with a, a certain version of the charm uh, force field, you know, uh, Fredolino and Scholten did ran their simulations. And they found, actually, that the low energy state for this thing looks like this. It's a helix bundle instead of being <coughs> a, a beta sheet state. Uh, <coughs> and it turns out after sort of poring over the data for a while, uh, the probable cause for this, uh, which has now been fixed in some of the newer versions of the force fields that people are uh, used to looking at folding, is that uh, um, when you're making uh, helical hydrogen bonds, you know, there's basically these hydrogen bonds that connect every fourth amino acid in the helix. And of course, there's also hydrogen bonds in these beta sheets uh, connecting amino acids across the uh, beta sheets. Uh, when you're making these hydrogen bonds, in a helix, they actually want to be linear. Uh, but in a beta sheet, they want to be slightly bent 160 degrees instead of 180 degrees. Okay? And it, it's not a very big energy difference, just a fraction of a kilocalorie per mole. Um, but it turns out the force fields were written in a way uh, that it wants to be 180 degrees. This is higher in energy. Okay? And so what happened is, you know, you're trying to construct this beta sheet, and it forces it to bend all those hydrogen bonds. And you know, piece by piece, you're adding up more and more free excess energy. And it puts the energy of that beta sheet higher up uh, than the energy of this corresponding uh, alpha helical state. And one lesson from this is that uh, you know, protein folding energies are really very small. I mean, if I take a protein in aqueous solution and I take one single water molecule and rotate it by, 180 de uh, by 90 degrees to break its hydrogen bonds, that's more energy than the entire folding free energy of that protein, okay. just by taking that one solvent molecule and breaking its hydrogen bonds. But the bottom line is that in uh, uh, more recent implementations, they have actually fixed this so that you can, in fact, make uh, this beta sheet state the uh, lowest energy state. And let me just f fast forward a little bit more. You know, we're now at a stage <coughs> where we can actually fully simulate uh, experimental data. And just to give you an example here, uh, this protein up there, uh, an alpha helix bundle called lambda repressor fragment uh, that we've studied is actually the largest protein that's been refolded on the computer from scratch, starting with a completely extended chain going down to a native state. 
<coughs> and uh, one of the questions is when proteins get relatively small and very fast folding like this, are there still free energy barriers, like uh, what's shown over in A here, versus does the free energy kind of just go downhill from the unfolded state to the folded state, like what is shown on the uh, uh, right-hand side there. And in one of those cases, you expect that in the places where the transition states are, where you have a high uh, free energy, that the protein is not going to spend a lot of time there, so the probability of being there is pretty much close to zero. Whereas actually, in the case where these barriers have essentially disappeared, the protein kind of just goes through all these intermediate conformations with significant population probability, and uh, you'll have a non-zero probability there. And one of the things that's predicted by kinetic theory in that case is that instead of seeing uh, just a kinetic phase that corresponds to the protein moving over from the native well to the unfolded well, you can now also see the diffusive dynamics of the protein as it crosses that intermediate region. Okay? And when you look at that, you get uh, two things happening. First of all, um, if you look at uh, uh, thermodynamics of the stability of the protein, <coughs> you'll find that different measurement techniques, circular dichroism, fluorescence, various other kinds of things, actually give you different answers. So the protein doesn't have one value for what its stability is. It depends on what kind of spectroscopy technique you actually use to look at the protein. And the reason is that different spectroscopy techniques switch their signals at various places along the reaction coordinate, and depending on where you do it, you know, you'll get a different answer. Whereas if you really had only two wells with a big barrier in between, it wouldn't make any difference where the technique switches because there is no protein population where the technique switches, so you would get the same answer every time. And the other thing that's predicted is that when you look at kinetics, uh, you'll find that you can't fit it with a single exponential anymore, but that again, you get this much faster phase at early times that corresponds to the protein diffusing around on the surface. And so these are sort of things that we use to prove that the protein is going to this very fast, almost downhill folding uh, regime. And so this was a good candidate for doing simulations. And uh, Klaus Schulten's uh, student, Yangjing Lu, uh, took up the simulations. And we're actually now doing some experiments based on their prediction. And uh, they were actually able to completely refold this protein to the native state by a tempering method and to a state that's actually pretty close to the native state, even by a single trajectory. And the interesting prediction that came out of that uh, single trajectory simulation, but al also out of the tempering simulations, was that uh, it turns out if you want to make this protein fold faster and better, you might be better off clipping one of the helices off and making it even smaller. Normally when you make it even smaller and smaller, and eventually actually it won't fold all as well anymore because you don't have any of the hydrophobic interactions that hold the protein together. Uh, but they basically, uh, based on these simulations, are saying that helix number five in this protein um, actually interferes with the folding process by sort of sticking itself in places where other things need to be able to move to form the uh, native structure. And so uh, we're going to test this uh, by actually you know, just uh, genetically engineering a version of the protein that has that clipped off and seeing how it behaves. Does it really fold faster? Is it just as stable or maybe even more stable than the uh, uh, original protein was? And so it's got, get, gotten to the point where now uh, you can actually look at these simulations and you can make mechanistic <coughs> predictions about what is going on in the folding process uh, and then give the experimenter something that they can actually test to see, you know, does it happen that way or not. And th so that's basically uh, the stage where we have gotten uh, to nowadays where we can have this feedback where experiments can be used to improve the force fields and then the simulations themselves can actually uh, give you tips on what is mechanistically going on that you can then use to design experiments to actually test uh, these predictions. <coughs> okay, so much for protein folding. So that's like the first uh, you know, 20 minutes or something of the discussion. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, single molecule absorption spectroscopy, which is a project that we've been doing for years in collaboration with Joe Lighting's group, who kindly introduced me uh, just a little while ago. And uh, you know, the way that normally people do absorption spectroscopy <coughs> is you have your sample. It's got some molecules floating around in it. You're shining in a light beam and less light intensity comes out at the other end. And why is that? Well, the light was absorbed by your sample. And uh, typically, though, however, you know, your sample uh, at some point, and, you know, as you keep sending your laser beam in, it doesn't just keep heating up and heating up and heating up. And that's because actually the light is being re-emitted eventually as terahertz light. So actually, even absorption spectroscopy really is, is a form of a delayed scattering spectroscopy because you're sending a beam in, you get less light out at the other end but actually the energy that you're pumping into the molecules is eventually re-radiated off as terahertz radiation. But the bottom line is normally the way detect the people detect absorption spectroscopy is to look for the attenuation of this beam here. Okay? 
Now, that wouldn't be uh, very good if you want to look at absorption of a single molecule, although people in a tour de force have actually managed to even make that kind of work. And the reason is, I'm sitting in this beam that has 10 to the 20th photons in it, and I have one molecule there, right? And when it comes out on the other side, it'll have 10 to the 20th minus one photon in it, right? If I have only one molecule there, that's gonna be really hard to see, okay? It's not a very effective way of doing it, let alone the fact that lasers that you might be using for this actually have quantum statistical fluctuations in their intensity. There's all kinds of other things going on that would make this incredibly hard to do. Another way that you can imagine doing absorption, and that's also been done for the past 30, 40 years, is uh, instead of looking at the laser light being attenuated, look at the molecule. So in that case, what you do is you shine the beam of molecules at your detector instead of shining the laser at the detector, and you shine the laser at a right angle, and the molecule flies through this laser beam and it gets excited here, <coughs> and now the excited molecule flies and hits the detector, and because it has more energy, you know, in this example here, it starts vibrating because it's excited by the laser, when that energy is deposited in your detector, which is a calorimeter, you'll get a slightly bigger blip than when the molecule flew in there without the laser being tuned to resonance, right? So if the molecule <laughs> just hit it, you get little blips, and if the molecules hit it, but they've been excited by the laser, you get bigger blips, right? And so that way you can tell that absorption has taken place. And so uh, <coughs> we wanted to sort of head more in that <coughs> direction uh, and actually look at the molecules for clues of absorption instead of looking at the beam of light, just because of the large numbers of photons involved making it just hard to look for that very tiny amount of attenuation. And so that's where Joe comes in, into the picture, uh, since uh, the way that we basically wanted to do this experiment, and it's shown uh, over here, is to take the molecule we want to look at, and I'm gonna talk about carbon nanotubes uh, for today, <coughs> on a surface, that's transparent at a wavelength where the molecules absorb. So in this case, you would have to use a carbon nanotube that has an absorption maximum that lies within the band gap of the silicon in order to get your laser uh, through. You, by the way, you might say, well, why don't you just shine the laser in from the front, you know, and then you don't have to get through the substrate. You don't want to do that. And the reason is, when you shine the laser from the front, uh, it will invariably be, the light, the, uh, the light will be absorbed by the tip to a very significant degree. And you have a macroscopic object that's supposed to scan things with angstrom resolution that you're heating. That is a very bad idea. It just makes things, you know, go all over the place to do that, okay? So we send it in, in total internal reflection from the back, so you only get a half wavelength evanescent wave that does much less, you know, sort of damage to the signal by heating. Anyway, the molecule is small enough that it's bathed in the laser radiation, and if you put the laser in resonance at the right uh, wavelength, uh, what happens is this molecule is going to absorb that light and its electronic structure is going to change or it's going to start vibrating, you know, it's going to change in shape, and then you just scan the STM, which basically looks at the local electronic density of states, and that density of states will change if the molecule changes shape, and that's basically what you're looking for in this experiment. There's one other trick that you have to do that I'll just briefly mention, which is, um, you can't just scan over the surface of the laser off and look at the molecule and then scan over the surface again with the laser on and look at the molecule. And the reason is, you know, any people here who <laughs> do STM, <coughs> it would be impossible to scale and register the two images to see those small sub-angstrom or angstrom kind of uh, variations that you get between the absorbing and the non-absorbent molecule. And so we have to come up with a technique that we can basically subtract the signals directly as the scanning is being done. And it's actually pretty straightforward. What you do is you actually frequency modulate the laser. So the same laser power always hits the surface of the sample that you're looking at. Um, and so the heating doesn't you know, change you know, when you're doing that. And so you frequency modulate it in and out of the line shape of the molecule. And what's gonna happen is, as the molecule absorbs and changes shape and then doesn't absorb and changes shape back, you do that at a few kilohertz, uh, the tunneling current is going to be modulated. So instead of getting a constant tunneling current when you're sitting on top of the molecule, if the molecule is absorbing and the laser is turning on and off, the tunneling current is going to be <laughs> rapidly modulated. And then you can use a f modulation amplifier to just get that signal out as you're scanning instead of doing an entire scan and then going back. <coughs> that greatly improves the uh, signal to noise of this procedure. So here's an example, for instance, of a short piece of carbon nanotube sitting on a passivated silicon surface. You can see the dimer <coughs> rows from the silicon surface. There's a step uh, in the silicon surface over here where the dimer rows are perpendicular uh, to one another. And if we measure an absorption spectrum of this carbon nanotube with the, you know, by tuning to the right wavelength, uh, you see the absorption image here. So when there's absorption, it's, it's shown in black. And if not, it's a gray background. And you don't see any of the dimer rows or that stuff anymore because you know, they're not absorbing. Instead, you see an image of the uh, carbon nanotube. If you pick a carbon nanotube that's at the wrong wavelength and you try to measure the absorption image, you don't get any contrast. So here, it's the same gray here on the carbon nanotube as what you get over here. The, the noise that sort of switches from black to white here that you're seeing around the rim 
unlike where here the entire surface of the carbon nanotube has changed uh, in, you know, t uh, uh, b into black. Uh, that is actually not an absorption signal. That simply happens because what happens is the way the SDA works on, you have a tip that's sort of moving along. It's scanned by these piezoelectric scanners. And then as you approach the molecule, your tunneling current increases, and so it moves the tip back. Okay? And there's a certain response time involved with that and a certain noise of the motion as this stuff moves around. And some of that noise happens to be at the same frequency as your laser frequency. So while you're doing the step going up on the molecule and the step down on the other side, there's some excess noise that comes through. So to have a real absorption signal, therefore, you have to have a contrast between the entire region of the molecule that's <laughs> absorbing the outside, not like you have up there. Uh, not this kind of uh, edge noise. Um, <coughs> so here's another example of this, where we have two carbon nanotubes uh, lying right next to one another. And it's kind of a little bit hard to see here, although you can kind of see the stripes on them. But we can actually identify uh, what type of a carbon nanotube it is by looking at the chirality, or basically the angle of these benzene you know, rings with respect to the axis of the carbon nanotube. And it's different for those two. And indeed, if we scan in this case to 1,250 nanometers, even though those two guys are sitting right next to one another on that surface, one of them is absorbing and the other one is not uh, <coughs> doing any absorption. So we can basically optically differentiate by single molecule absorption, so to speak, these two tubes that are sitting right next to one another on the uh, surface. Here's another example where we have a carbon nanotube <coughs> that has been manipulated to have a defect. You can see it looks just a little bit brighter than the rest of the tube that's sitting on the silicon surface. And sure enough, if we do a IV curve measurement, what you find, let's actually do the, the red curve over here along the axis of the nanotube. You know, here's the band gap of the carbon nanotube out here. And then it actually shrinks when we get to the defect. And then the band gap increases again. And so <coughs> what that says, would suggest is that if we tune the laser into resonance with the nanotube at the top and bottom, uh, you're going to be out of resonance with the middle part because the band gap has changed actually quite drastically by 40% in this case. And that's what you observe here. Uh, you get an absorption signal over here and at the top, and you don't see anything in the middle. And because we're using phase-sensitive detection, I mentioned that we're modulating the laser, we can also go to 90 degrees where you don't expect to see a signal, and we basically just mostly see noise there. Um, so there's an optical measurement that sort of <coughs> works together with the current measurement. And you know, I'm not going to go through any of the details in the slide, but actually, you can use this to estimate what the size of an exciton in a carbon nanotube is. So basically, when you excite an electron in a carbon nanotube, there are sort of two general ways by which the electron might move. It could just move in the conduction band around by itself and not care what happens in the valence band at the bottom anymore. Or there's a hole left over down there, OK? And, uh, you know, and the electron is up here. And so there's a Coulomb attraction between the two, and they actually might move as a pair or an exciton, OK? And it turns out it's pretty clear now, and I'm not going to get into all the details of it, that in uh, carbon nanotubes, you have basically exciton excitations in, in by, by the kind of optical exc excitation that we're doing here. And so these excitons can move around the carbon nanotube, but they can't penetrate into that, uh, into that uh, smaller band gap because of the energy mismatch, right? And so by solving a uh, soliton Schrodinger equation and comparing it with our measured uh, you know, rate at which this uh, you know, decays along the axis of the carbon nanotube, we were actually able to determine uh, the size of that uh, exciton, which turned out to be uh, 2 nanometers in diameter. The theory for this particular carbon nanotube had predicted 1.6 uh, nanometers. But that's, I would say that's pretty good agreement okay, between the two. Uh, I just mentioned in closing, there are other techniques that people have in the meantime developed since we did these single molecule absorption experiments first uh, by using, for instance, optothermal effects, so basically using heating uh, from the, as I mentioned, you know, eventually the light that's absorbed gets turned into heat or terahertz radiation. So you could use the heat that's generated. And there is even one experiment where people have strung a carbon nanotube across the slit of a spectrometer and just gotten enough absorption cross-section to actually be able to uh, measure an absorption spe uh, uh, spectrum. And so uh, the problem, though, with these methods here is that your spatial resolution is limited. And I'll come back to that at the very end of my talk. Uh, you basically don't get any significant spatial resolution, whereas by our method, we get uh, angstrom-level resolution on the molecule. You know, we, can see, we can tell one part of the molecule, like that nanotube I showed you, from a different part that's adjacent to it, just you know, less than a nanometer away. And so that's what I mean by our ability to actually do submolecular resolution spatially, uh, single molecule absorption spectroscopy. So I'm going to shift gears again uh, a little bit, but stay with the STM theme uh, for the middle of the talk here, and sort of ask this question is, is alpha sitting in a glass, at least on the surface, 
uh, of it. Uh, uh, amorphous silicon or asilicon is an important you know, material that's used in a variety of applications where you might want to have sort of low power, like you know, handheld pocket calculator, those kinds of uh, devices and have uh, solar cells. Uh, it has a very weird property, which is that unlike other glasses, uh, this particular amorphous solid, and we all are agreed that amorphous silicon is an amorphous solid, is not obtained by supercooling a liquid. So normally the way you make a glass is you take a liquid <coughs> and you just cool it quickly enough so that the molecules or atoms in the liquid cannot move into their crystalline positions. Okay? And you're kind of just freezing the liquid in a conformational state that still looks somewhat liquid-like, so it's sort of random. Um, uh, but the viscosity is so high because you're at low temperature that it doesn't move anymore. So it's kind of like a liquid that's stuck. Okay? And that's how glasses are normally made. And then you could observe the glass transition and so forth, but you can't actually make uh, amorphous silicon that way. So I cannot take liquid silicon and cool it down because all you're going to get is crystalline silicon because you just can't do it fast enough you know, uh, to get the amorphous one. So usually the way it's done, it's, it's grown by vapor deposition or by ion implantation, which are actually the two examples I'm going to show you here of how we did it. So you could actually take crystalline surfaces and damage the heck out of them until they're amorphous. Or you could have a very cold surface and deposit silicon atoms on it one by one from the vapor. So they kind of just freeze in place and make the amorphous uh, solid that way. So down here is just sort of a picture from a simulation at IBM that gives you an idea of what this amorphous lattice might look like as opposed to a completely crystalline uh, silicon lattice. So you still have a lot of the bonds being made, just like water has most of its hydrogen bonds made, just like ice. But you know, you break like half or one of the bonds per tetrahedron of the silicon making for, and that's it, and you get a disordered uh, solid instead. People have been thinking for a long time about what kinds of properties are necessary for something to be declared a glass. And one of the things, from a theory uh, from the like, late 60s or early 70s, there's been a lot of work done since then, but I'll just stick with this, is the idea that when you actually freeze uh, <coughs> your liquid into a glass, what happens is tiny crystallites begin to form that might be just like a few atoms in diameter. Uh, but then eventually, if you're cooling fast enough, they can't keep expanding so that one of them wins and you, fo you form a large domain. And that's how you get stuck with these super, super small you know, crystallites that are then amongst themselves amorphously arranged. Okay? And that's sort of a postulate of what the structure of a glass looks like. And in fact, what that theory actually predicts is that once you're in this supercooled regime, you have these little globs. And the theory actually predicts very specifically there should be about five atoms in diameter, or five silicon dioxides, or five silicon atoms in the case of a amorphous silicon glass, that you have these little balls. And, you know, uh, and, and, and basically, uh, what can happen is these balls can still move, even in the glass. Okay? But chances are they can't really diffuse around. So these balls are not going to just diffuse around on the surface going anywhere they want. And the reason is your, the surface has a lot of, you know, it's, it's a glass surface, so it's you know, highly irregular and corrugated. And the chance that there are even two free energy wells next to one another that even have a similar free energy is already small. So in most cases, the ball is just going to sit in the minimum. It's going to be stuck there, right? But occasionally, there's a chance that two of them will have similar free energy and be near one another. And then the ball can hop, hop back and forth, right? And there's an even smaller probability you could have three of them near one another. So the ball can hop in three places. But eventually, I mean, that probability of having lots of them at exactly the same free energy and right next to one another is very low. And so what that theory predicts, therefore, is that the motion of glass dynamics is mostly two-state motion, just like spins flipping up and down. You've got these balls going back and forth. Okay? And that's one of the characteristics that's predicted by some of these theories as the characteristic of a glass. So uh, Sumit Ashtekar, who's sitting somewhere there in the back of the audience, uh, did experiments where we basically <laughs> took metal glasses. So it turns out you can actually freeze metals, fast, some metals anyway, fast enough to make uh, glasses out of them and make glassy films. And he cleaned off the oxides on the surface of these films in UHV <coughs> and looked at the surfaces. And so you end up with something that looks like this. Uh, it's this sort of lumpy, corrugated looking surface, you know, no uh, you know, extensive long range order on there. And if you look at it, uh, you know, there's sort of a length scale of lumps that you see in various places you know, on this surface here. And it turns out that length scale is in fact approximately uh, five atoms in diameter. So maybe those are actually those little balls that the glass people are talking about that behave like two-state systems. Okay? And so then the thing that Subit really got going well, which took quite a while, was to be able to scan STM uh, 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 images of the same region of the glass over and over again, hour after hour after hour, 
people who do SDM know how tough that is to get like an image that's good and consistent quality without the tip crashing or something <laughs> bad happening, right? Because if you want to take an actual movie of dynamics, you know, you don't want just to do a single SDM scan, you have to do hundreds of SDM scans of the same place and they all have to look good, otherwise you can't use the darn thing, okay? So he got that to work after a lot of sweat and, and time being spent. And so here is one of those movies and there's actually a bunch of motion on this surface, but I just highlighted one cluster here that doesn't seem to be moving and one over here that is moving and this little trace <coughs> is just sort of a, a single molecule or a single cluster trace, if you will, of uh, what that cluster is doing. But let's, let me just start it up for you. So we're going through the movie, and you see it just hopped up. It moved with the blue circle, and now it hopped back. So it's hopping back and forth between these two places, and there it goes up again, and there it goes back again, and it just basically keeps doing that. You know, you can follow the trace down there also. And so indeed, uh, the dynamics is, uh, that we've seen, at least well over 90% of what we see on that surface is just these clusters of a few atoms in diameter hopping back between two places on that surface, sometimes up and down, sometimes translating like what you see here back and forth horizontally. And so we can take movies like this, you know, here's again, you know, there, there these two clusters are a little further apart, here they've come closer together because one of them has hopped, they're still close together, it's hopped apart again and so forth. And so we can actually get statistics on the kinetics of this motion and by analyzing these single cluster traces, you know, how much time does it spend on one side versus the other, um, and uh, we can actually determine both what is the rate of kinetics, you know, of going back and forth, and what is the equilibrium constant, right? Maybe one of those states is lower in energy, then it's gonna spend more time in that state uh, than it would in the other state. Like here, for instance, you know, it tends to spend more time in the state that I call zero than in the state that I call one, which tells us that that state is a little bit lower in energy, right? Because it spends more time there. And so we can analyze all these things, and I'm not gonna go through all the analysis and things that we have done since time is short, and I have a couple more things I want to talk about. Uh, but one of the bottom lines I want to point out is that this morphology seems to be pretty universal. <laughs> Where you look at it on metal glass surfaces or silicon surfaces that are done by d different kinds of methods. Uh, we can do them by ion bombardment, as I said, we could do them by uh, this, uh, vapor deposition from the vapor phase. You find that you get cluster size distributions that with un within uncertainty are about three or four uh, atoms in diameter. Not very far away from what's predicted by the theory that says they should be five atoms in diameter. Again, what the theory says is that when I have the liquid, the things that are moving are one atom in diameter because every atom can move anywhere at once, right? And as I lower the temperature, you start getting pairs and three and whatever moving. And eventually, and the motion gets slower as the viscosity increases and things have a tougher time getting past one another. And basically what that theory predicts is that universally when you reach about ball size of about five, that's when things have gotten so slow that that's it and you're just stuck. So you could have gone to eight or, or you know, bigger things, but then you would have to wait an enormously long amount of time to actually get there. Nobody's that patient, okay? So uh, here's again the same kind of thing for uh, silicon, uh, an amorphous silicon surface. And again, you know, if I hadn't told you that this is a silicon surface versus the metal surface that I showed you before, it looks the same, right? It's the same relative cluster size compared to the size of the atoms, and the same kinds of two-state motions are occurring uh, back and forth on that surface. Um, so we can detect these balls that are about, you know, a little less than five atoms in diameter. Uh, we can't, yeah, we don't have quite good enough resolution yet to actually look at vibrations or motions of individual atoms within these balls, but that's actually something we're working on. You know, I won't let Suwit graduate until he gets that, <laughs> wherever he is. <laughs> um, now, the prediction from the bulk, though, is for, uh, for how long should this, how fast should this hopping be? I mean, I'll go back to one of these movies for a second. You can see there's a time scale of minutes on these axes, and the same was true for all the other movies I was showing you, minutes to hours. Basically, it takes these balls somewhere between <laughs> a few minutes to an hour or something like that to hop back and forth. But right? that's the kind of kinetics that we have to explain. Well, it turns out the prediction for bulk glasses at the temperature that we were doing these experiments, at room temperature, well below the glass transition temperature, for our particular uh, case, is 36 kT, okay? And if you calculate how long it would take one of these balls to move back and forth, it would take about six times 10 to the 21 years, okay? That's what I call 0.01 moles of years. You know, normally you don't associate the counting units of moles being used with time, but in this case, it's such a long time scale that I can count in mole years, all right? So that's off a little bit because we see a time of 10 minutes to an hour, okay? That's a little faster, obviously. But of course, we're not looking at the bulk of the glass. We are looking at the glass surface. That's why I started, is amorphous silicon a glass at least on the surface, right? 
uh, because we're doing this by scanning tunnel microscopy. Well, it turns out that same theory uh, through some very clever and simple derivations actually predicts that if you have this thing on a surface instead of having it sit in the bolt, that uh, the activation energy actually depends on the surface area that's in contact with the surroundings, and you're halving that surface area, and so the barrier should go down by a factor of two. So instead of getting a 36 kT barrier, it would be an 18 kT barrier. Okay? <coughs> and uh, uh, so when you plug that in, things are looking a little better. Now we're down to 14 years at room temperature instead of 10 to the uh, 21 years. So when I called up these guys, you know, Stevens and Walls, and I told them, well, you know, uh, we're getting like one hour, and you know, I mean, even your thing is giving us 14 years. Their answer was, well, the model's only off by a factor of 10 to the 5. In, in glass <laughs> theory, you know, we're used to being off by like 10 to the 50th and things like that. So by the time you're off by 10 to the 5, you really have gotten essentially the right answer, <laughs> as far as those guys are concerned. Because a fairly small tweak of the activation energy, like going from 18 to 14 kT, uh, just lowering it by a few room temperature units, that's going to make it go from 14 years down to you know, the kind of hour time scale that we've seen here. It turns out that there's two kinds of relaxations on these glasses in the bulk. We don't know whether those also exist on the surface. Uh, and it turns out one of these is the one that I just talked about that you know, in this case would take 14 years. The other one is actually predicted to be 0.3 seconds. So that one's too fast. So there's one that's predicted faster and one that's predicted slower. Um, but there is actually another paper <coughs> that came out by these same guys, to their credit before we published our data, that actually said that you know, what you might actually get is that under certain conditions, these so-called alpha and beta relaxations are really separate from one another. And you really have a peak at 14 years, and you have one at 0.3 seconds. But under certain conditions, and it may happen on surfaces, these peaks might actually coalesce, and you might see a result that lies somewhere in between. I wouldn't have believed this, of course, if, I had, if they had like, written this up before I showed them the data. But it was actually already published you know, beforehand. So, uh, so maybe there is some, uh, some hope there that we can get these time scales uh, to agree. OK, for the last couple of minutes, I'll just have two more slides here, some other stuff that I'm just going to, I'm not going to do it justice because I will treat it simply in one slide because I realized as I was making slides by the time I got here, like, I only have time for two more slides. So I'm going to treat all the other things instead of 10 slides each like I did so far, like one slide, right? So we're down to that. So this is a uh, collaboration with Steve Bopart on fast cancer margin detection. And he is, of course, the whiz of various kinds of uh, backscattering and Raman techniques. Uh, and the idea of uh, near-infrared or Raman vibrational Im imaging techniques is basically the following. Uh, that if you have cancerous versus non-cancerous cells, let's say in breast tissue, uh, the non-cancerous regions have far more lipid in it and expressed protein. The cancerous regions have uh, even more proteins and also a lot of uh, DNA in it because the cancer is more rapidly you know, growing. And so that gives you a spectral difference, because it turns out various of the vibrational modes of proteins, like carbon-hydrogen stretching motions, they are different between DNA and protein and lipids. And so you end up getting uh, different uh, uh, signatures. And this has been known for a long time. People have been doing Raman spectroscopy experiments to look at cancer tissues for, for ages. Uh, what we were interested in is whether we could have a technique that would give us much faster data detection than Raman spectroscopy, which takes hours, literally, you know, to collect the data. We wanted something that would work like in seconds, if preferably, or at most a minute or something like that. So you could maybe use it operatively. Mm -hmm. okay. And we wanted something where the output signal is linear. And that's the other real problem, because there are, of course, all kinds of nonlinear Raman laser techniques that are much higher power and therefore much faster as far as getting you signals. But the signals depend very nonlinearly on the uh, on what you actually have in your sample. And there are these backgrounds that arise that sort of make it very difficult to tell how much stuff you actually have. So if you want something that's really quantitative as far as being able to tell the difference between the cancer and non-cancer tissues, these <coughs> techniques are somewhat iffy. Okay. So basically, we want something that's fast and therefore nonlinear, but still has a linear signal. We don't want to have to do labeling. We want to have fast sample preparation. It should be insensitive backgrounds, all these kinds of things. And it turns out, well, uh, this near-infrared vibrational imaging actually fits the bill. And the idea is that unlike a standard CARS or coherent antistone Raman <laughs> experiment where you're looking at these vibrations of the proteins versus the uh, lipids, and uh, uh, instead of a conventional experiment where you're sending in uh, just this one <coughs> set of beams, you use a reference beam that you interfere uh, with the beams that are probing your sample. And you can actually show up, I'm going to go through all the math, although it's relatively straightforward, that by doing an interferogram between these two beams, you can actually recover a signal that has the same sensitivity that you get from the nonlinear high laser power technique, but it is linear in the concentrations. Okay. And so that gives you a method uh, 
that's much more analytical. In fact, actually, the first paper that we ended up publishing on this was, I, I could have thrown that one up there, but the cancer thing is more interesting. Just to show how well this works is, the paper, uh, is a paper where my student basically used this method not to do anything with cancer, but to just actually assay lipids. Like, how accurately can we tell different, very similar kinds of lipids from one another? Like, uh, you know, uh, rapeseed oil from canola oil from this and that oil from, uh, from uh, uh, coconut oil and what have you, right? And it turns out our assay by this technique, and I'm not showing the data here, was just as accurate as the best chemical assays that people have. Except the chemical assay takes you like an hour to do, whereas this takes a few milliseconds to get the data. Okay. <coughs> and so hardened by that, uh, we applied this to cancer tissues. And what we basically found is that indeed there's enough of a difference between the tumor and normal tissues. And with the speed and the linearity of this technique, we can extract signals that are sufficiently accurate that we can actually come up with a simple spectral correlator that simply correlates to a color code, you know, where red is cancer and blue is healthy tissue. And the sample that you're seeing here, this is a tenth of a millimeter uh, scale. So we can actually detect cancer boundaries uh, with tenth of a millimeter accuracy. And uh, <coughs> this particular method, I mean, here, it's, we haven't tested this on, on human breast cancers yet. This was basically tested on rat breast cancer models, okay? Uh, we obtained, actually, a 99 percent diagnostic accuracy, both for the positives and for the negatives. That's considerably better than what people are able to do by conventional staining techniques on microscope slides nowadays, uh, when you let a pathologist basically do the cancer diagnosis. In fact, actually, in the journal, we wrote up that it was 99 percent. Actually, our statistical analysis was that it really was 99.9 percent .9 plus, but we didn't even dare you know, say that, <laughs> put a nine on there. You know, that, just, that just was too much. You know. Um, so really, you can tell the boundaries between healthy tissues, like what you have at the top there, and incursions from cancer tissue uh, down to the well below submillimeter uh, length scale by using this technique. And the, both the data collection, which can be done on a tissue sample that doesn't have to be stained, prepared, or anything like that. You can just cut out of any size piece, throw it on a microscope slide, and measure. Okay? And the data analysis, both of those really are fast. They basically can get done in, 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 in a few minutes. And actually, the thing that... Uh, Steve and I are now thinking about, and he has students you know, working on that in this group, is how can we put this whole thing into some kind of portable cart you know, that you can move around in a hospital instead of having it be in some kind of a laser room like the uh, original experiments that we did here. So the last thing for a couple of minutes is a project that was actually <coughs> the first paper ever published with somebody at the Beckman Institute uh, with Jeff Moore's group. Um, but which gets us back to a current collaboration that Leia is you know, working on uh, uh, with Jeff Moore's group that, that also involves the scanning tunneling microscopy work. So back in the Stone Age, you know, one of the things that we're interested in looking at is how these uh, polyphenylacetylene <coughs> polymers, they're basically, think of them just as benzene rings connected by acetylene bridges at 120 degrees. And then you can take these things and flip them around to make hexagonal shapes. You could, for instance, take, if you have a whole bunch of them, could flip them around in such a way that you could make a spiral, okay? And that's what's actually shown over here. So you have this macromolecular spiral that makes a helix, kind of in the same way that a protein makes a alpha helix. Here you're making this uh, organic helix. And when we measured the kinetics of how this thing folds from an extended random state where the polymer is just sort of squirming around in solution to this very compact helical state, what we found is some unusual kinetics uh, the kinetics had to be fitted to a stretched exponential e to the minus time to the power of beta, where beta is not equal to one, as it would be for an exponential decay, but is considerably less uh, than one. And we have actually some success with a very simple model uh, where we basically used uh, just a Hamiltonian that's equal to um, a, a stacking interaction energy, you know, when you put the benzene rings on top of one another, and an energy for twisting. So the, our Hamilton was epsilon n plus j times m. That's about as, where n and m are integers. That's about as simple as it gets. And when you ran uh, pseudo Monte Carlo kinetics with a reasonable move set that would uh, give you the, you know, look like the real moves that the molecule can do, we were actually able to reproduce this kinetics that consists of these very fast phases initially followed by much sl slower phases, which gives you this kind of uh, stretched behavior. And so back then at the time, we also put these things on, on our STM. And you can see some cases where we did sort of low solution coverage on the STM, high solution coverage, where we were even able to use the tip to nudge things around and make patterns on the surface, like arranging them into little lines or squares or things of that sort. 
But that was actually before the single molecule absorption days, you know, before the stuff that I talked about more towards the beginning of my talk. So now actually we have the capability of putting these things down on surfaces and doing single molecule absorption spectroscopy on them in this dissipative environment where in many cases things don't even fluoresce. I mean, that's one of the advantages of doing absorption spectroscopy. Everything always will absorb, right? even when you don't get any fluorescence because the fluorescence is being quenched. So you're much less limited in what kind of environment you can do experiments in by uh, absorption experiments and by fluorescence experiments. And so one of the things that we're interested in looking at, which is what uh, Leah is spending a lot of time in the synthetic labs over you know, in, in the Moore group right now, is to basically make these sorts of dendrimers with a certain number of uh, uh, donor dyes hooked up to them, right, where you can then channel energy in principle uh, down to an acceptor. And uh, the kind of thing that we would like to see here is whether we can actually uh, look at that channeling process. So the idea is that what you would do in this case is you would excite, and I should, uh, um, um, you would excite, uh, you know, over here with a laser pulse this region of the molecule because you know this dye here does not absorb; only those two guys absorb. But you would actually scan your STM over here and look at whether the size or the electron density of the dye at the other end is changing. Because if there's energy transfer, right, you're going to excite that blue one there. It's going to change shape, and you're going to be able to see that in the STM. And so we can actually then do a single molecule energy transfer and electron transfer experiments with these designed organic compounds where we can put energy in and transfer it over to different parts of the molecule. So that's basically where we would like to take those single molecule STM facilitated absorption experiments in the near future. And now, you know, with two minutes to one, I'm stopping and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, and so uh, when we, we measured the distributions, I didn't show it here, the distribution actually goes from a size of eight in diameter down to a size of two, but it doesn't go higher than that. And again, the reasoning that's given by the theorists is what's happening is uh, when you have a liquid, you have just individual, say, metal atoms and the liquid metal moving around, right? And as you're cooling the temperature close to the uh, you know, melting point, these things tend to start sticking to one another, and so you get larger clusters. But then they also move more slowly because the viscosity increases, right? And at some point, I mean, what is a glass? A glass is still, the stuff is trying to move like liquid, but it can't anymore because the viscosity is really large. And the point where the viscosity becomes larger than human patients, so it takes like hundreds of hours to see anything move at all, that's when the clusters have reached the size of five. So if you could age, as they say, the glass even more and wait for, let's say, 10 to the 20th years or something like that, then you might see clusters that are 12 in diameter moving even more slowly. But we don't have that kind of patience when we're making glasses. Mm -hmm. Did you suggest that you don't need chaperones always? Yes, not always. So, so what would be the essentially going all over the configuration space? Is that sure? Yeah, so what, well, we've done experiments inside cells that I didn't talk about here today, yes. where we can actually show that if you take apply a temperature jump to a fluorescent label protein inside a cell and it unfolds, and so the fluorescence fret signal changes. Um, when you cool it back down, so you do the inverse jump, you recover almost 100% of the previous signal. If you do the same experiment actually in vitro, in a test tube, you recover maybe 80% of the signal, right? Because it's, it's mostly reversible, but you do form some, you know, when these proteins become unfolded, they can start sticking to one another hydrophobically and they become, and they partially aggregate. So actually, it turns out having an aqueous solution causes more aggregation of the protein at low concentration than having that protein in that crowded environment inside the cell. So it looks like the cytoplasm has evolved uh, mechanisms to allow proteins to fold. Now, some of these could, of course, be chaperones, and that, that's what's going to happen in many cases. But if you actually just do a count of what is the latently expressed chaperone density in the cells, and what is the number of all proteins that are folding and unfolding continuously because they have such small equilibrium constants, it's just a matter of mass balance. You just cannot explain you know, all of those events b just by chaperones. So the chaperones must be there to take care of the more difficult cases, but they can't, there's just not enough of them to take care of every possible unfolding and refolding event. Mm -hmm. Question about the cloud environment. When you have a cloud, cloud itself, right? Would you comment whether it's a restriction of the space which influences the folding, or it's a structure of water, for example, like the water is more water now? And yeah. Um, so uh, all I can say there is that when we uh, do experiments like this and compare them with very simple theories where they basically assume that your crowding is just like wooden balls, you know, and then the proteins are stuck in between, so that would have no water or any of those effects built in. 
you can get semi-quantitative agreement <coughs> with the experiment, like within a factor of two of melting point changes in the, you know, and, and uh, a factor of two in the rates or things like that. And so the answer is, to a zero-order approximation, probably the wooden balls are crowding the protein picture is fairly accurate, but it doesn't give you an exact you know, agreement with experiment, right? And so now the question is, well, is that because they assumed spherical wooden balls and they really should assume corrugated shapes of different sizes for everything, which would still be a purely steric explanation, or is it actually chemical interactions <laughs> that play a role? Now, one thing I can say is we've done this experiment in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and what we actually find is that even though the, uh, the degree of crowding in those two compartments is actually about the same, just from the density of solid materials in the nucleus versus the cytoplasm, it turns out the stability of proteins is much greater in the nucleus, and they also fold much faster in the nucleus. And we can't explain that by pure crowding. So that would have to be some kind of a solvation or electrostatic or some sort of effect like that. But the bottom line is crowding alone sort of gets you the order of magnitude certainly right. right? It doesn't necessarily get you the details right. Quick question. Uh, the glass materials, if you were to drape, uh, say, a layer of graphene over mm -hmm. the top, you would affect the dynamics. Yes. You'd still be able to see the glass. Yes, absolutely. So that might be an interesting thing to try because you might find that the additional, well, maybe not. So maybe there is enough additional friction from a graphene sheet that when you do that, uh, you see no bumps moving anymore, right? Or maybe just like you know, someone under the covers, you know, <laughs> they are still moving back and forth and you see the cover sheet sort of move around. That would be an interesting experiment to try. Add a half a molar to uh, assume it's so, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's right. So, but but see, the problem is that he already has a job in Intel starting next summer. So he's yeah. already and they're waiting. There's a deadline there. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's thank Mark for a very interesting.